Um, hi, everyone. My name is Rachel Adams. I'm the Chief Curator and Director of Programs at the Bemis Center in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, thank you for joining us today for the hospitality of images. Um, I know people are still trickling in a little bit, so that's fine. Um, again, thanks for joining us. I'm going to go through a few slides of some upcoming things at Bemis, and then we'll get into the panel. Um, and but before that, if you are able to chat in where you're joining us from, we'd love to know um, from around the world where everyone is joining us from. So please do that in the chat. Um, and I am gonna go into my next slide. Um, so uh, if you're not familiar with the Bemis Center, we are a 40 year old um, contemporary art organization based in Omaha, Nebraska. We have an exhibition space as well as an international artist residency, um, which one of our panelists, two of our panelists technically, um, have been residents at Bemis before, which is really exciting. Um, and currently right now, that are curated under the rubric Intimate Actions um, with Paul Mapaghi Sapoya, Joey Farso, and Maria Antelman. Um, and so if you're in the area, please uh, schedule a visit to come and see these exhibitions. They're up through uh, April 24th. Um, if you're not in the area, you can um, go to our Vimeo page and watch um, conversations that we had with each of the artists, as well as a performance that we did for the opening um, within Joey Farso's exhibition. So there's plenty of content to explore there um, and lots of things to see. So. Um, we hope that you can visit us either in person or virtually. Um, currently, we um, are accepting applications for all of our um, upcoming residency programs for 2022. Um, and one really exciting one is we have now launched the application for the Sound Art and Experimental Music Residency. Um, so we are going to be doing a Q&A about that specific tract within the residency program on March 10th at 3.30 Central Time um, with Juan Jose Rivas, who was our um, spring 2020 resident. Um, and you can see him here pictured in our sound studio. Um, so join us on Instagram Live. Um, if you miss it, you can watch it again. We'll, um, we'll post it onto our Instagram TV um, and share the link. Um, so if you, but if you have any questions, you can chat them in and ask us um, live on March 10th. Um, as part of our new sound art and experimental music program, we do have a music venue called Low End. Right now we're doing only virtual events. Um, and our next one is with the group Princess. Um, on March 11th, Thursday night. So you can join us um, and watch um, one minute at One Minute World um, on Twitch. And then there'll be a Q&A afterwards with Alexis and Michael of Princess. So hopefully you can join us for that. These are the dates for our current um, applications. So if you just go to bemacenter.org, you'll see an apply button. So if you're interested in applying for our artist in residence program, sound art and experimental music program. Those are both due April 1st, um, sorry for the summer 2022 artists in residence. Um, we are actively looking for our next curator in residence um, and Sylvie can maybe speak briefly about that um, experience, um, but this will be the 2022 to 2023 curator in residence. Um, that application is due May 14th. And then we have um, our fall 2022 artists in residence program, as well as our alumni residence and artists in residence program. Um, those are both due August 16th. So lots of opportunities to apply, um, lots of information online. Um, you can directly contact us if you have extra questions. Um, so please, you know, take a minute if you're interested and, and look at those and look at our brand new website, which we're very excited about. Uh, and then just thanking our sponsors for today, um, specifically the residency program is um, supported by the Mellon Foundation, the National Endowments for the Arts, the Nebraska Arts Council, and the Nebraska Cultural Endowment, Omaha Stakes, um, the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, the William and Ruth Scott Family Foundation, and the Wilhelm Hound Foundation. So thank you to our sponsors for keeping us um, free and open to the public and supporting all of the artists that we have in residency. Um, okay, let me go back to the first slide. And I'm going to introduce um, Sylvie Fortin. 
Um, Sylvie is an independent curator, researcher, critic, and editor based between Montreal, New York, and Omaha, Nebraska, where she is currently, as I mentioned, the 2019 to 2021 Bemis Center Curator in Residence. Um, she was executive and artistic director of La Biennale de Montreal um, from 2013 to 2017, the executive director and editor of Art Papers in Atlanta from 2004 to 2012, and the curator of Manif de Art 5, the fifth Quebec City Biennial in 2010. Her reviews have been published in numerous periodicals, including Art Forum, Art Papers, C Magazine, and Flash Art International. And her essays have appeared in many catalogs, readers, and anthologies. She is also the editor of PASS, the Journal of International Biennial Association. Um, and she, as I mentioned, she's our current curator in residence. Sylvie has done um, two projects with us so far, and we'll have two more coming up um, towards the end of this year. Um, so without further ado, thank you, Sylvie, and I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Rachel. And um, I just wanted to take a minute to thank the Bemis team behind the scenes, Jared Packard, who's doing a fabulous job at um, managing the chat, and uh, Davina Schreier, the Director of Communications. A big thank you. Um, I couldn't think of a better place to start this series of public talk than to do it with Bemis. For the artists and the curators in the audience, I really um, encourage you to look at this opportunity. It's, it's, uh, it's a fabulous context to work in and develop experimental ideas um, and frankly, quite life-changing. So please do consider it. I also want to thank Carmen Victor, uh, Public Journal's managing editor for her assistance. And finally, thanks to each and every one of you for joining us today to celebrate the launch of Public 61 and start the conversation. Uh, some of you may not know Public Journal. So here is uh, the issue that we are launching today, 320 pages, fabulous writing and great artist project. The journal was founded in 1988 uh, in Toronto and is an interdisciplinary journal that focuses on visual art. If you want to learn more about public, just go to their website. Uh, it's publicjournal.ca. So why are we here today? Uh, given the theme of the issue, which is hospitality, I wanted to, to uh, release the issue and perform hospitality in that way. So today's launch, is uh, today's event launches a dynamic month long series of, uh, of talks, which offers an interdisciplinary exploration of the currencies of hospitality. The series mobilizes and amplifies the publication, positioning it as a relay for the exchange of ideas and a vector for attentive engagement, open debate and speculation around questions of hospitality. The next three events will explore the relationship between hospitality and architecture, curating, performance, and community. We'll provide links uh, for these events in the chat and um, also a link to order a copy of the issue. So how are we gonna do this today? The session will be in three parts. Each speaker will present their work and ideas for about 15 minutes. Uh, David Petros will be first, followed by Felipe Steinberg and Bezad Kosravi Nori. I'll then moderate a short conservation with and between the panelists that will last about 15 minutes. And we'll keep the 15, min the 15 last minutes for you. Um, so please uh, type in your questions in the chat section and I'll try to get to as many of as them as possible. Today's session, including the, the chat and Q&A um, are being recorded. It will be published um, on our YouTube channel. So if you have any question or if you'd like us to withhold your name, uh, please email us later today at public at york.edu, at yorku.ca. So public at yorku.ca. Today's session brings together three artists who have developed new projects for Public 61. David L. Petros, Felipe Steinberg and Bezakos Ravi Nuri are joining us from Chicago, from Brazil, and from Sweden, respectively. Their work bears witness to the power of images, documentary, staged, animated, gaming, to relay meaning, memory, and emotions that render belonging and exclusion. 
On behalf of everyone in the audience, I'm delighted to welcome David, Felipe, and Bizad today to speak about the hospitality of images. David Petros's photo photographic and installation work is informed by research in global modernism, construction of modernity, theories of diaspora, and post-colonial studies. Petros completed the Whitney Independent Study Program, an MFA in visual art at the School of the Museum of Fine Art, Boston and Tufts University, a BFA in, photogra in photography at, Colum at Concordia University in Montreal, and a BA in history at the University of Saskatchewan. He's currently assistant professor in the Department of Photography at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And he's represented by Bradley Artascaran in Montreal and Tiwani in London. His exhibition, Spazio Disponibile, which means available space, initiated by the Power Plant in Toronto is currently on view in Buffalo and you can find information in the chat section. So without further ado, um, please welcome David Petros. Thank you very much, Sylvie. I hope everyone can hear me. So I would like to, to begin by thanking Sylvie for, uh, for the opportunity to, um, to be part of this project, to be part of this publication, but also to be part of this conversation. Uh, thank you, Sylvie. I would like to extend my gratitude to, um, to the Bemis team, Jared and Rachel, um, and express my pleasure to be here with my fellow artists, Felipe and Bezad. So I would like to introduce the topic by way of a slight, um, by way of a slight digression, but one that is rooted in, um, in a misrecognition, which bears importantly on the work and the ideas that inform the work that, uh, that I've contributed to this edition of Public 61. So on June 7, 2016, a video and this photograph extracted from the video, a young man appeared in Italian and European media, he depicted a figure handcuffed and being led away from an airplane by Italian police onto the tarmac in Rome. So this photograph was splashed across news websites under headlines that hailed the arrest of the people smuggling kingpin Medhane Yehdego Mered, otherwise known as the general. This arrest was supposed to be monumental. It was the first time European police had been able to apprehend one of the most powerful smugglers facilitating and profiting from the European migration from the so-called European migration and refugee crisis. The young man in the picture is Medhane Tesfamariam Berhe, who in uh, 2014 had snuck across the southern border of Eritrea in the Horn of Africa into Ethiopia and eventually made his way into Sudan. And once in Sudan, his plan like that of many other young men and women that are fleeing Eritrea and the, the neighboring East African states was to find a smuggler who could get him into Libya and then across the Mediterranean to Italy. <clears throat> so Barhane grows up in a middle, middle, middle class neighborhood in Asmara, the capital of Eritrea, finished high school in 2010, took an apprenticeship, excuse me, took an apprenticeship with a carpenter and then worked briefly as a dairyman's assistant, delivering milk, keeping track of accounts, etc. So this was obviously a case of mistaken identity. But he languished in a Palermo prison for four years until his eventual release in July 19, 2019. In a 400 page judicial report that traced this four year ordeal, the judges concluded that the prosecutors and investigators accusations were quote, apparently appeared patently inconsistent and inadequate, adding that the accusations against Berhe were quote, dubious on a logical and conceptual level and demonstrated serious neglect. So the photographic image here 
is considered as a co-constituent element of a specific historical and cultural moment in view of the fact that they are powerful networks of image diffusion at the moment in which narrative, the narrative of the quote, European migration and refugee crisis <clears throat> and the criminalization of migration itself was structured into one singular project. But what does this photograph describe? How does a refusal to be open to history produce failures of recognition, proximity, and hospitality? The figure of the criminal mastermind, the human trafficker, the perpetrator of the inhumane acts who's brought to Europe from elsewhere is the relationship that I argue is brought sharply into focus in the image on the left. But it's important to remember that it's rooted in the photographic production of the Horn of Africa, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Somalia, which has historical resonance in the formation of Italian photography, in which events that amount to images of arrest, arrested persons and trials are a dominant subject. So in considering the power of photographs as image, as image texts, it's imperative to understand how the trans-Mediterranean traffic that shapes these contemporary representations of, of migration into Italy deal with subjects from Africa, but do so in a highly reductive manner. That is, these image texts highlight and overemphasize a non-familiarity, a messy layer of representation in which strata of historical and cultural familiarity, Italy's relationship with cultures of the horn, the history of Italian colonialism and Orientalism are denied. So ultimately, when we look at the traces that return to the Italian peninsula from this region of the Horn, the subjects of the empire, such of the former empire, such as Berhan, uh, such as Merhane Berhe, reveal a profound displacement that I would argue lies at the core of any image text of migration that circulates within Italy in the contemporary. So allow me one more digression to set a formational context. So roughly in 1869, the Rubitino, an Italian shipping company, arrives in Asa, Eritrea, in the Red Sea, lays the groundwork for Italy's first colony in Eritrea, which is formally established in 1889. And by 1936, Eritrea, Somalia, Ethiopia are integrated into Italian East Africa. So the unification of Italy itself from a series of small states into a single state, the Kingdom of Italy, is itself completed in 1871. So these parallel processes, the formation of Eritrea as a nation state, the formation of Italy as a nation state, are difficult to conceive of as independent projects. So the work itself, roaming around the edges of the familiar is a visual essay whose contents were produced mostly between uh, two other major projects, um, two distinct yet related projects. The Stranger's Notebook 2016-2017 looked at the question of African migration into Europe, and the, but by highlighting the relationship of, of the movement to Europe via the migrations that occur within the continent of Africa itself. So the emphasis in the stranger's notebook was the Western side of the Mediterranean, Morocco to Spain, Mauritania to Canary Islands, but also the movement from Libya to Lampedusa. Spacio Disponible 2019-2020 differed in its mode of locating the specificity of migrants. So the shift from African migrants to migrants moving into the Italian peninsula from Eritrea, Ethiopia, Somalia, the Horn of Africa. So this latter project examined built forms of the colonial space 
modern architecture, cinemas, houses, as well as infrastructure, roads, trains, cable cars, and their effects. Specifically, the way infrastructure projects remade the colonial landscapes in the natural world while producing the ambiguous colonial colonizing subject relationship between Italy and the Horn of Africa. So roaming around the edges of the familiar considers the traces of imperial conquest that identify public space in both Eritrea on the left and Italy on the right. It looks at street names and markers, public squares, monuments, and it examines these as urban interventions that on the one hand situate people, orient movement, choreograph assembly, but also as continuing to produce ambivalent meanings and unstable relationships between the, the former colonizer and the, former colon and the formerly colonized. So the work is articulated as a walk. The production involved walking countless miles in Italian cities, Palermo, Rome, Milan, Catania, Napoli, and invariably encountering streets, squares that are named after former Italian colonial settlements and battle sites in Africa. So this ubiquity of colonial references, which situates empire within the contemporary Italian landscape is intended to acknowledge and sort of interrogate how these memories are situated in the everyday gestures and utterances of Italians inhabiting these spaces. Eritrea, Akurdet, Asmara, Asab, Karen, Dunkalia, Masawa, Sanafe, Adigret, Adwa, Desie, Diridawa, Jimma, Gondar, Makele, Ogaden, Tigre. But I also walked endless miles in Asmara, which in 2017, importantly, is designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site due to the overwhelming repository of Italian architectural and urban interventions and a cultural and social environment that have been preserved faithfully in the present. So what roaming around the edges of the familiar intends to do is to help move a much needed debate on the failure of Italian public memory, to acknowledge and fully reckon with its colonial history. So as Eritreans and other East Africans arrive on the Italian uh, and arrive in the Italian peninsula, this problematic displacement of historical events arises. So what I wanted to do in through these photographs is do more than just re-examine Italian colonial history, but to do so with a parallel investigation of how these colonial memories are managed, reconfigured, but from the perspective of a former Italian colonial subject. That is, to ensure that the discussion of Italian colonialism and its absence in the national memory do not exclusively focus on memories of Italians, for doing so continues the mistake of always keeping Italians centered at the center of a limited colonial view. So the questions that inform the work, my guiding questions in producing this walk and these photographs, became where is the colonial era in the memory of the formerly colonized? What are the ruptures and continuities of history and memory? What forms of hospitality can be performed when space is seemingly familiar yet different, but is wedded to dynamics of empire that are asymmetrical? In this type of a circumstance, can a realm of hospitality exist? To what extent can hospitality be negotiated in these types of sites of public access? A group of young air trains in Catania, Sicily. How can remembrance be redeployed to open up a space of recognition and relation? Can understandings of identities, positions, and roles such as native, 
newcomer be destabilized. The capital city of Asmara, Liberation Avenue, Gorena Harimet. Cinema Dante. Milano Pension. Pizza Eritrea. Catania, Sicily. What forms of hospitality can be performed when space is seemingly, if differently, familiar? What other terms may we enlist to describe our kinship rather than our differences? Thank you. Thanks so much, Demi. That was amazing. And, um, and from everyone in the audience, a big round of applause. Um, Next, I'm delighted to welcome Felipe Steinberg. Felipe is uh, an alum of the Demas Center. Um, we met there, I guess, a couple of years ago. Felipe is an interdisciplinary ar artist whose work considers constructed meanings of the local and the global through processes of decontext decontextualization and recontextualization. He enlists various types of media and systems of circulation to explore the thickness between social space and interpersonal encounters. Felipe attended the Whitney Independent Study Program in New York, the core program at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and the Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture. He's been an artist in residence at Bemis Center, as well as at Raw Material Company in Dakar. His work has been presented internationally, and he's been awarded the Idea Fund Prize from the Andy Warhol Foundation and support from the Houston Arts Alliance um, Artists Individual Grant Program, amongst many others. Um, Steinberg is the co-founder of ACA, Art and Culture in Context of Authority. Authoritarian, I have a hard time with that word in English, authoritarianisms, a working group studying, discussing, and articulating collective and individual responses to contexts of authoritarianism with a special focus on Brazil. So welcome, Felipe. Thank you so much, Sylvie. Um, first day is like, I feel very good to be back here to Bemis, even if it's like this. It's good to see Davina, Jared, and Rachel again. And um, it's very nice to be here with Bazad and Dawit. Thank you, Dawit. And um, also, I'm very happy for your invitation, Sylvie, to be part of this, because I think your invitation pretty much triggered a lot of ideas. And uh, I think the, my presence in the journal is it's very important to me because this project started from your invitation and is becoming something else and I'll try to explore those layers here and I hope it can come through. Um, this project pretty much, as I was saying, deals with um, a relation I have with Dakar and um, I was there for two months when I attended the raw material company residency. And uh, the invitation from Sylvie came like a few weeks after I returned from there. And I had a lot of things to process of that experience. It was my first time in Dakar, also my first time in Africa. And what I started considering about was not what I, at that point when I was in my 30s, what I knew of that context, but like how I built my relation to that context from from my small context in Brazil. What were the 
perspectives that I had and in the end, what were the mediations in place that I had to know of the place that I ended up being there physically many years later. And digging into my memories, I encountered this very strange set of uh, uh, apparatus maybe that were the manifestations of like how this place was perceived to me through my childhood and teen teenager years. And uh, I do remember very well that we had this car in Brazil. Maybe it's a car that is in other places as well. That's from Mitsubishi and the car was, had a special edition and was called Pajero, but Pajero da Car. And this car was a uh, kind of uh, object of desire here in the country, a sort of a mark of class. And um, of course, the, at the time I didn't know what Mitsubishi means, Pajero means and Dakar means, but it was pretty remarkable to me to see that on the back of the car, it would carry the logo of Dakar and with this emblem. And later on, I start connecting this to the experience I was having through television. And then I realized that this car was related to the race that was broadcasted every year. Like at least in Brazil, it was like this, it was an important event for sports at sorts. And uh, that event, the Paris Dakar Rally, was a rally invented in 1979 and pretty much is about uh, a race, motorcycles, uh, cars, and trucks that they would go from Paris to Dakar and they would stop throughout the African continent in, in many cities. And, uh, and of course, it's a very spectacular broadcasting sort of um, uh, with, with helicopters and etc. And that was kind of the context where these things were connecting in my mind. The car, this object of desire, this experience of Africa through these uh, spectacular shots of cars going very fast through the landscape. And not only this, but I also digging into my memories, I remember that they had this very favorite game. I think in English it's called Top Trumps, where you would play cards and you would use like the qualities of certain, uh, depending on the context. In this case was the race. So you would play with your friends with these cards and try to beat each other by having a higher number in the quality of your own card. So, and this is, I have it here with me, this set of cards. And was called a super trunfo here in Portuguese, Paris Dakar as well. But not only that, this set of cards, I, I start remembering also that I was really much interested in playing this video game for the, I mean, this was early nineties and the video games started becoming a thing for domestic consumption. And uh, I had this set, a console from Atari and uh, Atari had this game that was somewhat successful and I would play a lot with my friends that was also called Paris Dakar. Paris Dakar 90 was done by this uh, Tom, Tomahawk, this lab for games. And um, the game would mimic very much the structure of the race where the stage of the race where in the real life you'd go through the cities in Africa in the video game the checkpoints or where you would rest in between the, the states would be the cities. And this game had uh, seven stops and uh, each stop would be relaxing and, and the name of the city. And I started remembering that those pauses in the video game were pretty much very absurd and digging into some YouTube videos of people playing this game. I do remember a lot of things that start triggering me a lot of uh, memories from this relation that I'm trying to build here. And uh, the video game, this was like how the screen, the first screen would look like. And uh, eventually this is the image from the cockpit. Uh, so pretty much this is something that I'm dealing with how I deal with this from before being there. After arriving in Dakar, I start to intuitively, maybe I start moving towards this idea of the race. I had it in the back of my mind, trying to understand that context through what I knew about it. 
And I managed somewhat through the raw. We managed to spend a whole afternoon at the archives of the Radio Television Senegalese, which is the public broadcasting company of Senegal. And that day we went like for four hours through all the tapes they had of the race, not since 79. Just to say this is not what I'm, this video project is not what I'm showing here in the magazine, in the journal, but this is a project that is expanding towards something that I don't know yet, but I do have some footage related to this moment that I want to talk a little bit about. So while there in this archive cave, basically, we went through all these tapes and uh, what was pretty amazing for me because it was a long encounter, we ended up talking a lot about random stuff. So at some point we were talking about how to archive things. So here you cannot have a small library and you want to archive everything. And then the other person answered, yes, but you have to see, you know, the budget to record an archivist. So this moment not only became a space to look at the memories of the rally, but also to this endless discussion about archiving. And uh, I think what for me was pretty remarkable to go through all these tapes was to find out that uh, the, I mean, what I was trying to find, and I don't know if I did find, but I was trying to find this relation how the local TV or how Dakar itself represented by the television that's public uh, saw the race. And I was interested in the perspective of the race from that their perspective, trying to counter how I perceived the race through all these Western mediations through the Trumps, through the video game or through the broadcasting or through the car. So, and it was pretty incredible to see that somewhat the public television throughout all the tapes somewhat, they were very much interested in the race as a piece of propaganda and lies very entangled to the idea of uh, they're optimistic about the race. And here, especially in this tape, uh, was funny to see that the daughter of the president was there and they emphasized a lot that she arrived in Dakar from Paris. And uh, I think that was a moment for me that was really nice and they were making fun of this. And um, another remarkable thing that happened this day, that's something maybe I want to think about, is that while we were there, there was a huge protest outside. So I did realize that the public TV in that context is tend as a manifestation of power of perhaps the manifestation of colonial power in a diluted way many years after. So, and then we also ended end up in this endless discussion because we spent the whole day doing this there, but suddenly the protest arrived because that was the space they would protest against the government in the television. And we were really concerned if we would be able to let it, us out or not. So for me, here was this moment in between this image and archives and some sort of um, reality literally knocking in our door. So we were like, are you sure that they will let us out despite the protest outside? So we decided to leave. And this television there has endless corridors. It's really incredible. And, um, and as soon we leave the gates of the television square, it was like a very, intense experience where we have to cross this crowd for almost 20 minutes and then eventually end up in a more calm space and uh, end up taking a taxi and going to where we had to be that afternoon. This is what I'm saying all this is just to give some context for the project that I proposed to Sylvie and to the magazine. And this is sort of a background, this is how the project is expanding and giving some more context. So now maybe I'll jump a little bit more into what I proposed to Sylvia and to the journal. Uh, in the last few years, I've been really interested in look, looking at this new technology that's pretty much used in many places, but is more prevalent into driverless cars, cars that drive themselves. 
This is a system that where the car not only uses the sensors of approximations, but the car literally is a machine that has an eye. And this machine that has an eye can recognize every single element or can index every single pixel in an image. Not only an image, but the image is in movement because the car, of course, is in movement. And uh, so that's pretty much how it operates. The car is driving around and is looking and recognizing and labeling everything. And out of the labels, this list of nouns are produced. So it goes a little bit like this. The status of it. Or like this. This technology is named instance segmentation, where literally each instance is segmented, recognized, labeled, or put in another way, every pixel is indexed. So going back to the video game, what I did and proposed to do here in the magazine was two things. One is to think of the structure of the game and this idea of the checkpoints that stand for the cities. And those cities, they stand for a kind of a pause and a reflection moment. In the game, they are called a relaxation moment. So they're literally called relaxing Dakar, relaxing Kais, relaxing Nema. So what pretty much I did, I run the technology of instant segmentation throughout these steel frames that were these transitions in between stages. And uh, here is not a stage yet, but is when this race is starting in Paris. So as you can see here, and here is after the instant segmentation. So out of this segmentation, a list of labels and nouns were produced. And out of this list, I produced something. But just to explain how it ended up in the magazine, this first page pretty much gives a context of everything I said here and uh, kind of an intro, as if you're playing the video game, this would be like where you receive your mission or something like this. And uh, after these first two spreads, the next spread will be located after a few pages in between articles, also mimicking the structure of the game. So from now on, I'll just try to, to read what I wrote for the magazine, and maybe later on we can talk more about it. But just to clarify, after every single pause checkpoint, uh, after running this instant segmentation technology where every pixel in the image was recognized and a list of labels and nouns were produced, these worked for me as triggers from memories, micro memories and micro narratives from the context and from this perception of what I know or what I knew through the mediations in place uh, from when I was in Brazil. So in this spread, the spread number two, it goes like this. Relaxing in Tumu. They took good care of the rug and never put their shoes on the pillow. Fruit was eaten after karate on Tuesdays and Thursdays. There was a curtain, a man and a woman. Also the window had a safety net for the sun. Next. And then the following thread would be the same image, but with the text. Rel relaxing in Najemna. They had a tree, a boat, and a pet bird. An egg got stuck in its cloaca, and the bird died. They didn't drink water. The building had a playground where they got wasted on fake grass. The sun was always green, and there were no seasons. Relaxing Niame. They washed their car every Sunday and played video games. In the game, a woman breastfeeds breast a baby. They were in love. A tent, a bone, a banana, a can, a spring, a rag, a man, a bucket, a rug, a box, a car exhaust pipe, and an umbrella. Relaxing Nima. They had a house and two cars in the driveway. The mountain was in the encyclopedia. 
The monkey was the mascot for a local football team. The moon, only on the weekends. Palm tree at the club. Mandarin, the language of the future. Felipe, that's about time. If you want to wrap up your last thoughts before we move on. Relaxing Caius, they would all masturbate together on top of a mountain while the car was running. The parking lot had the small rocks. They took photos of the camel's knees when they were five at the zoo. They had hope. They had a helmet to play hockey on the cement. And the last one, relaxing Dakar. They spent every summer by the water under palm trees in the south summer. In the south summer is in December, fireworks. They watched pilots on TV. Dakar was a rally. They were in Africa for the first time for an art residency. Thank you. Thanks so much, Felipe. And now it's my pleasure to welcome Besad Kosravi Nouri. Um, Besad and I met a few years ago in Stockholm and have since crossed paths many times um, in all kinds of places throughout the Balkans uh, when I was doing research for a while. Uh, Besad is an artist and a writer based in Stockholm. His artistic research uses personal experience as a springboard to establish a hypothetical relationship between personal memories and significant world events, between micro and macro histories. His practice enlists films, installation, and archival studies to investigate histories from the global south, including those of political relationships that have offered a counter narrative to the Cold War East West dichotomy. He mines contemporary history to raise questions about border crossing memories in order to explore their entanglements and non alignments. He examines the fates of narratives when they cross borders and the future of our collective past. He's a PhD candidate right now at Konstwerk in Stockholm, finalizing his dissertation entitled Three or Four Irrelevant Stories, Art in Hyperpolitics. Welcome, Bizad. Uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Sylvie, for um, uh, inviting me. And uh, thanks, um, David and Felipe, it was amazing listening um, to you. Uh, I'm very much delighted to participate to that issue and, um, and hopefully I can summarize everything that I have been working on that project in a very short time. Um, I would like to begin uh, my, uh, my talk by presenting the, the episode of animation, um, uh, which is from Zagreb film, uh, is a series of animation, it's called Professor Balthazar. And um, basically everything that I have done so far in that particular project is really much related to that specific episode. So it's almost two and a half, three minutes animation. And then I try actually to talk a little bit faster in order to address all the points and dimensions of uh, my project. Uh, sorry, let me just again um, look at it that everything is fine. Sure, yes. In Professor Balthazar's town, there lived a man named Martin. He would have been quite an ordinary Martin, except that he had a big problem. Nobody noticed him. <laughs> Martin was miserable. Nobody, absolutely nobody, ever noticed him. One day, he went to Professor Balthazar for advice. Balthazar opened the door and, of course, he didn't notice Martin. Martin was persistent. (laughs) 
Well, for the first time in his life, Martin was noticed. Martin poured out his heart. Professor Balthazar started thinking how he could help him. And he had it. He invented a book for him called How to Climb to the Top of Success. But every page in it was empty. The professor quickly explained it was Martin's job to fill the pages with the story of his success. Full of hope, Martin said goodbye to the professor and started off. Martin left town. And how strange. At that very moment, people began to notice the absence of a man whom they had never noticed before. Now, suddenly, everybody missed him. And so they went to Professor Balthazar. But even he didn't know where Martin was. In a special session, the city council decided to erect a monument in Martin's memory. But since nobody recalled exactly what Martin looked like, only the pedestal of the monument was ceremoniously unveiled. It was a monument to the unknown citizen. Um, if you consider that, okay, there is Martin. So Martin was on top of the mountain uh, um, being friend with the Arthur the Eagle. So basically he left and he preferred non-human than human. So um, this is my, the title of my um, uh, participation to that, um, uh, in, um, to the journal, a monument, Professor Balthazar and a monument to the invisible citizen. We are talking about um, the very important animation production uh, company, uh, which took place during the mainly it started in in, in mid uh, 50s and continued until 80s but the golden age of that production uh was during the 60s in former yugoslavia in the city of zagreb so the the, the people that you could see in that image they're the balthazar uh professor balthazar team uh left uh zalatko girgic is the director of the series of professor uh, balthazar among the other uh, animator and, and artists that they produced that, that series. The significant about that uh, production within Golden, uh, within Zagreb Animation was that it was the only animation that they produced for kids. The other animation that they were producing uh, in that period of time was quite philosophical, critical animation. So this is actually very important. And they look at Professor Balthazar as a form of um, uh, uh, business model uh, to sell it to, to the countries. Interestingly, I'm from Iran. I grew up in, in, in Tehran during the 80s. So I grown up with Professor Balthazar. So it was one very important question for me when I started this project that how I know Professor Balthazar. Eventually, I understood that I'm not the only person who knows Professor Balthazar because um, there are a lot of people that they were living within global part of South that the, the country during the Cold War were not part of East or Western Bloc, they have memory of Professor Balthazar. So there is some sort of political relationship uh, within the context of Cold War that I started to investigate. Um, and uh, um, that investigation partly, of course, was related to the uh, to the visiting the place, interviewing people, and also looking at the um, already existing uh, document. Everything uh, in my uh, analysis that I, um, I have written uh, in, in the journal it started from that specific moment in 1948 when Tito decided that, okay, we want to be a socialist country, well, but we do not want to have any form of affiliation or relationship to Soviet Union and Stalin. It was that moment in 1948 in Communist Party in Belgrade that he delivered seven hours um, uh, 
speech, speech and uh, uh, clearly defined that we are independent socialist country. Interestingly, very soon after that, um, the, uh, there was a production grade meeting Walter and Nor Nor Nurnberg, Doga film in 1951, which is actually the first film animation production after Second World War uh, from Yugoslavia in a very Disney-like way, which is propaganda about why Yugoslavia needs to be independent and not accept any capitalism, neither socialism. But later on, they, understood, they, they, they started to criticize the form of production of Disney model as a form of, of course, coming from the capitalistic society. So they invented their form of animation, as you could see, for example, in that um, animation, Professor Balthazar. 1956, Brioni meeting, Tito understood in order to um, have allies around the world, he needs to create relationship and friendship with global founders. The first uh, uh, head of leader, uh, leaders of countries that he invited in Brioni Island, his island in south of, uh, in, 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 in Croatia, in Adriatic Sea, was uh, Jamal Abdel Nasser and, and uh, Nehru, Jawal Nan Nehru. And they signed Brioni Summit Agreement. Brioni summit agreement was not necessarily the point of departure of non-aligned movement, but however, somehow related to the idea of um, uh, meeting that took place in 1961 in Belgrade that later on was recognized as non-aligned uh, movement. So it was relationship between global South, mainly newly independent countries. And some of them in 1961, they didn't have, when they came to, to Belgrade, they didn't have the leader of country. So basically Yugoslavia invited the head of, the, the leader of liberation party basically in, in, in the meeting. So, and it was very important for them to emphasize very clear message to East and West that neither East nor West. This image here is very interesting. This is a poster in the backdrop of one of the episodes of Professor Balthazar. As you could see clearly is uh, 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 um, uh, Andy Warhol, very famous work, Marilyn Monroe in 1965. This is a kind of like a mocking of Andy Warhol, uh, very famous um, uh, work after two years in 1961 in the backdrop of the work. They're putting mustache on the, on the image. So somehow emphasize or materialize the notion of neither East nor West idea. For me as an Iranian, it was quite interesting to see that notion of neither East nor West is actually the main slogan on, to, uh, uh, slogan on top of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Iran after revolution. So basically, this is very important things that they said, neither East nor West, Islamic Republic of Iran. So you could see that how much that politics of non-aligned movement and the foundation of revolution in Iran was interconnected consciously or unconsciously, or at least part of the revolutionary people, they tried actually to, to emphasize that global uh, um, uh, identification characteristic of revolution with the global resistance, which failed, of course, miserably very soon. The other things that was very interesting for me to look at the notion of monument, that Yugoslavia has a very interesting history in relation to production of abstract uh, a monument as a form of site-specific memorial, which is very much connected to the memory politic. One, is, one thing that is mistakenly defined um, in the kind of popular culture that uh, these monuments are uh, uh, brutal architecture, which are not, they are site-specific, mean, meaning that all of them, they are in the absolute uh, uh, location that there was a partisan monument, uh, partisan activities. And one of the very important things that uh, they started to build those kind of uh, very huge uh, monument was uh, that um, 
that uh, the Stalin and Soviet Union was trying to uh, lure in down the activities of partisan for liberation of Yugoslavia. So in Yugoslavia, they started to create, emphasize the place that there was more partisan activities. So for me, looking at the last uh, the failed monument within that concept, which was actually building Petra Bogora, was quite interesting to see that how uh, the notion of animation and monument both coming from the uh, cultural production of Yugoslavia could be connected. So we have a monument to the invisible citizen that we watch partly the, the animation. And then we have a monument here. I started to create some sort of link between them that how is it possible to create some sort of relationship between these two monuments as a new form of a monument to the invisible citizen. So there was a structure as a form of playground, historicizing the idea of non aligned movement, historicizing the political contextualization of the animation production, and how these two are related. And at the same time, I was trying to trace my own memory, because this is my memory. By doing everything, I was trying to take care of the history, the very tiny, strange, small story in the back of our head, which needs to be taken care. The notion of hospitality in that sense comes into the fray. That how much is crucial to take care of those fragments of history and how that macro small form of historiography are connected to the larger frame of political, in, in, political um, conflict. The first exhibition took place in Marble Park in Stockholm in 2018. The second one called Mar Museum. There's a third uh, presentation in the Malmö Kunst Museum in 2019, which we present basically the permanent workshop at the end of the museum, which was the result of activities and symposium. It was art encounter in in Romania, which was very interesting because there was a uh, um, uh, memory of uh, Balthazar because the, uh, the, the, the Timoshuara, that it was the place that I presented the work was in the border of between Yugoslavia and Romania and older generation, they remembered Professor Balthazar because the analog signal, TV signal could cross the border of course, and they could watch it. So it was actually quite interesting to target one specific generation in Romania. The last exhibition that I had was in Hadelu, Croatian Society of Fine Art in Zagreb. And uh, I, I basically, uh, it was open call uh, for, uh, for, uh, for a different institution to come and, and, and give us proposal in order to, um, to, to have the monument as a permanent piece. So the, the, the last exhibition was in fact the showroom for monument that how is it possible to donate it to the city of Zagreb. We received 16 proposal and we donated to the Ivan Gundolica Elementary School in the center of Zagreb, which one of the major um, 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 the, uh, um, concentration of that school is looking at the national minorities. So after a while traveling from one place to the other place, there's a permanent place in the yard of the, the elementary school in Zagreb. I tried to uh, looking at uh, the project with rising these questions and uh, is a work in progress, is it still continuing? What is the future of our collective past? I could change the notion of future here to destiny. What is the destiny of our collective past? Tracing the memory, contemporary history. The question of modernity is very, many, uh, very much important for me. That what is what kind of modernity that we could we could look by, not looking at the dichotomy of East-West and the political neutrality of non-aligned movement. What happened to art when it crosses the border? What exhibition does? And can I propose playground as a possible future for social monument? Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Bezad. And now I'd ask the panelists to come back with their videos so that we can see each other for the panel discussion.
Okay, amazing. Totally amazing. I feel like, you know, we could talk for hours on a single image or a single project of yours. So this, you know, it, it will have to be super condensed. Um, I guess my first question, as you're thinking about questions for each other, um, in your work, images are relays and vectors. They're on the move, they carry, they smuggle, they're constantly resignified, um, and every time that they're presented, they're opened up, um, you know, for further kind of contestation or resignification. They traverse geographies and cross time, they morph, they materialize, they connect in all kinds of promiscuous ways. Can we speak about um, the hospitality enacted um, maybe by your images? So for example, Felipe, um, you didn't mention but that the, the Paris-Dakar rally now is for a while was kind of transplanted from Africa to the UAE and now it's taking place in Latin America, right? That's true. Um, and I think that, so that's a really interesting parallel to the kind of mobility that Dawit was talking about. And then, Bizarre, I think what you offer to the conversation is uh, a, a, another circuit, which is the one, that moment of, um, of the sort of nascent decolonization and the creation of a, another way of relating beyond, um, you know, in, in the immediate aftermath as, as countries are gaining, um, you know, freeing themselves from colonial power or, or that first moment, but finding other ways of connecting. Um, so yeah, I don't know if you could speak to those questions. Sure, should I go first? Sure, anyone. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think the notion of hospitality is very much related exactly as the way that you, you were uh, defining in relation to my own work, that uh, uh, somehow we have to dig and research uh, of what is hidden under the powerful of, uh, under the shadow of powerful explanation. So we call it, of course, microhistory. But one thing that is very important for me to, uh, um, to point it out, that that notion of microhistory is always related to the notion of macrohistory. Mm -hmm. So there is, a, there is a form of resistance is, is happening in that intersection in the point that macro and macro meet. And for me, that intersection is actually the act of hospitality. That there is a kind of like a place of agonism all the time. And that mm -hmm. place of agonism needs to be taken care of. Mm -hmm. I think what I would uh, what I would add to that, Bezad. First of all, thank you for my introduction to Professor Bal Baldaza. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. uh, I was so moved by, you know, noticing an absence that they had never noticed before, and the extent to which I think my relationship to, um, to, to the imagery that I'm working with in this project is really rooted on the one hand in sort of the majority of their mundaneness. A lot of them are quite sort of simplified in terms of the usual manner in which I make images. And the project, what you know, sort of thinking through this notion of hospitality with, uh, uh, with Sylvie required me sort of thinking very differently in terms of my projects or, sort of, or approaching my images in a very different way. On the one hand, it required me going back to images that I thought I was familiar with and re-familiarizing myself because they were so overlooked. And then secondly, that notion of overlookedness became the way in which I could sort of talk about the absence in that relationship between Italy and its former colonial subjects as a mechanism of resurfacing photographs of the mundane that then speak to the condition of non-admissibility of the colonial subject, like Medhani Barhe, who arrives into Italy now, the condition of, his, of the admissibility is their capacity to be able to be incorporated into the now, into the immediate everyday now. Mm -hmm that the condition of the, the, the precondition of that is having shared a certain history. Mm -hmm. So 
if the recognition of that shared history isn't there, then the Italians can continue to deny this um, mm -hmm. this cult existence within within the, within the moment. So the photographs for me were simply an exercise of saying these two national projects emerge with each other. Mm -hmm. and so what are the threads of continuity? We know what the differences are, but what are the threads of continuity? And how does the photograph allow a sustained looking at that which sublimates and disappears into, into the normalcy of the everyday? Mm -hmm. So that for me is the act of hospitality, the, photo the photography or the image offers. Well, I think just to add to this a little bit, I think from on my perspective, what I was more, I came across yesterday this quote that I don't know who said that, but it says like every piece of criticism is an autobiography. And I was, I was thinking this idea of uh, autocritique, self-critique, and I think like um, maybe a step to hospitality start like, um, from this moment where you clean your own, you know, stuff. And um, I don't know, I maybe perhaps that what I was trying to do to patch, I think I like this idea that was just said about the micro history and micro macro history and finding the intersection. I think this intersection for me, this project specifically was this kind of autocritic or like uh, trying to understand how those notions are were mediated psychologically, historically, or like any any of these kind of mediations, I think. I like this idea of an autocritique, Felipe. One of the things that I acknowledged early on was that 2017 Asmara, the capital city of Eritrea, is transformed into is made a world mm -hmm. world UNESCO heritage site. And so part of what I'm encountering now is a renegotiation of the type of photographic image archive that sat in my parents' coffee tables under glass, but was never critiqued. Some of the type of images that we were looking at, you know, that I was sharing today, whose, you know, whose, uh, whose violence was simply just overlooked by, because we were so sort of caught up in, you speak of the Cold War, uh, Bezad, in the war between Eritrea and Ethiopia, which brings in the various, you know, the, the other, um, um, the, the United States and, and the Soviet Union. And so part of my, you know, part of this insistence, I really like this notion of an autocritique that you, and for me, it's an autocritique that is directed towards those of us within the Eritrean context who also need to, it isn't sufficient for me for the Italians to acknowledge their own colonial history. How do we, as people from the Horn of Africa, also engage in that same reflexive and reflective uh, sort of uh, interrogation of, uh, of the production of that project? The word integration is very important, I think, in that sense. And I do agree about uh, that part that uh, partly um, colonial memory uh, managed to, uh, to, to invisibilize itself. Mm -hmm why that notion of invisibilization is very mm -hmm. hard to recognize in order to tackle and critics. So basically partly when you come from global South, part of that colonial memory is actually unconscious colonial memory. So the first step in order to decolonize that memory, you need to be to make it conscious and then you could actually tackle on that. So this is actually the other kind of um, form of um, 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 researching, relooking, repositioning yourself in order to uh, not just take uh, for granted those elements or images as um, David mentioned. So I'm doing the same things. So I'm looking at form of family album in that sense to see that what is the unconscious colonial memory in that production of the images. So yeah, this is challenging really. It's not recognizable easily. Yeah, and I think it's really the, the other thread between you, I think, is, is, is this uh, notion of the monument, of course, um, because um, that we, what you were talking about, these uh, squares and streets is often also, uh, I think, another form of monument. Um, they're perhaps uh, they, 
perhaps they're, they're, they've not been as fragile because they don't actually present a body. I think that a lot of um, monuments that have been toppled, uh, graffitied, amputated, in part, it's a, it's a relationship of one body to another body. Um, and, and so you're kind of freed from that. And, and so the relationship, you know, between the monument uh, that you have bizarre to the invisible, uh, you know, the, the sort of disembodied, uh, and, and then um, the other monument, which is, you know, the street and the, and the sign. And, and so on the one hand, you, one could say, you know, tr traditional monuments perform and the monuments that you're talking about actually whisper. And, um, and, and so, you know, our strategy is a, is a different one, uh, visually, but also I would say sensorially. I don't know if you, if that notion resonates for you, this notion of the whisper. Well, I could just uh, comment quickly that a long time ago, I wrote an article about the uh, form of documentary film practice in, in, in Iran, and I call it Visperism. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <Sorry. laughs> I, I immediately identify with that idea that mm -hmm. Visperism as a form of resistance, that how is it possible mm -hmm. to get the notion of everyday uh, everydayness and keep that whisper mm -hmm. as, as a form of reminder that there is something that we shouldn't, we should, we cannot talk it loudly now, but we could whisper it mm -hmm. to each other ears. So, well, yes, I do agree, yes. Mm -hmm. And David, I was thinking of, you know, the street sign, which has a splash of blue on it. You know, it's kind of, you know, that's not a, it's, I don't see that as an erasure um, because it's not total and there would be a capacity to completely erase. So it's, 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 you know, it's a layered and, and that's what I was thinking of. Uh, yeah, the whisper in that case. And I think, you know, it's um, to take up a concept, a term that that you introduced a moment ago, there's uh, this notion of the memories or the, you know, the histories that are um, that we have to extract from the subconscious in a way, because mm -hmm. they they en they enter uh, they enter somewhere deep, and this is something that I've been thinking about really really deeply because of on the one hand I have this near allergic reaction to utilizing, for example, in relationship to Italy, the notion of amnesia, mm -hmm. because it almost feels as though there's a pass, right? It almost feels as though the inability to remember has a mechanism exterior to the subject that somehow delimits or inhibits the capacity to access a particular thing. So I think about conscious versus displaced. Mm -hmm. And it is in this manner, it is in this manner that for me, the street signs, as I said, it's in their mundane, in their everydayness. Love this idea of monuments, the performing versus the whispering. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's a deafening whisper, mm -hmm. you know, because of the manner in which um, one walks into bookstores, a pizza, you know, it's, you know, these everyday sorts of things, but you engage with conversations with the people in that context and there is no recognition of, mm -hmm. what, that, of what that sign sort of points towards, it's, but it's right there. Right there. It, it is so present. And so um, this is my attraction to these subtle things that are sort of burrowed, burrowed deeply, but are accessible um, and so to you know to make photographs of these small signage things and so that act of spray paint over the via smara is deeply sort of significant mm -hmm. regardless of whether or not regardless of whether or not one knows precisely what it is and i find that to be this in powerful anti mm -hmm. uh, anti sort of monumental gesture yeah, and, and we have like two minutes before we open for the audience. I guess my next question or my last question kind of connects Dawit and Felipe. And so that we think thinking of these sort of whispered monuments, the place names and so on, and thinking um, what, about them at the intersection of, of the sort of uh, digital uh, realm that, that Felipe was talking about. I'm really curious about this further level, which is that today, not only do we encounter these place names on 
on buildings and on squares, but they are on, on our mobile phones when we're navigating a city. So it's, you know, it's a very different relationship. It's in the palm of my hand. Um, and as I am walking, it's showing me that I am now here. Yes, Mara, whatever. Um, so there's a strange on the one hand intimacy. Uh, and, and, if, and, and, and I guess I would like to think about the relationship between that sort of handheld relationship and you know, one's feet on the ground. Uh, again, as this kind of deterritorialization or multi-territorialization that goes even one step further. Um, so, you know, what does it mean uh, specifically since we, we know that, you know, if migrants have one thing, it will be a cell phone, right? So, um, so I'd like to think about that with you guys um, in terms of, uh, of uh, again, that sort of, uh, further whispering and how do we counteract all that? Felipe, I will. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, it's a very hard question. It's a very good question. Um, and I guess I'll, for me, what's imp interesting, Felipe, too, is that, you know, what you were talking, showing us, everything is object oriented. Right? Yes. It's house, yeah. car, this, that. It's not relational. It's, it's one object another object, another object. So, yeah. It's discrete. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I'll, I'm try, just trying something out here, but I think this is, is weird to see how maybe the, there was a time that was the car was this object of maybe, I don't know, the 20th century object per excellence. And now this may be the cell phone is this new object, you know, the car is like, we don't think of cars anymore, but maybe of cell phones as this core component of our life, I don't know. And, uh, and how these two things are related to navigation, right? And how the experience places through before the car was mediating this, now cell phones are doing that job. And um, I'm going tangential in your question here, Sylvie, because it's hard, but those are the thoughts that came to my head mm -hmm. immediately. And, um, and I've been dealing a lot with this um, instant segmentation idea. And I, I mean, this is an idea that's been working, been worked in the art field for a while, but this idea of the eye machine, the, mm -hmm. the machine that looks, and uh, that perhaps at some point we will not need them to look anymore, but everything will be already cataloged somewhat and we will work not from reality but from what is in the what was recorded previously you know so I don't I, I don't know Sylvia I'm just keeping mm -hmm. your question maybe here I don't know to be continued yeah. <laughs> what makes sense to me Felipe is I like this notion of the catalog of whether it's catalog of information with which one navigates space in relationship to my own sort of in relationship to the questions mm -hmm. that I'm interested in it is in you know in Catania in Palermo encountering a lot of young you know young Eritreans Ethiopians Somalis etc who as you've said Sylvie it's just a matter of time before everybody has a phone and so the phone itself becomes not just the guiding mechanism for me, but it also becomes a catalog of images and so one of the things I'm interested in in this conversation is on the one hand thinking about the mobility of the migratory figure, but also really thinking about the migratory potential of the image itself, mm -hmm. and one of which resides and is cataloged yes. within the within the telephones and, uh, and the cameras that, um, that many of these um, sort of individuals have with them. And then it's just a moment in time where the image then, be, the, the camera becomes an interface to their Facebook, to their various sort of social media sort of forms. So all of a sudden the images from home in one way or another intersect with the space that, uh, with the Italian space that they're in, you know? So, um, yeah, I think that's, that, that, that's what I would add to that, so. <clears throat> so I guess we'll um, turn to the audience question. We have a few good ones that we could spend quite a bit of time on. Um, 
And a question from uh, Lorenzo Fuzzi. And Lorenzo curated uh, the a Liverpool biennial edition, I think in 2012, around questions of hospitality. So it's uh, a question that's near and dear to his heart. And he asks us um, a really interesting question. So I'll uh, paraphrase because it's, it's long, but basically saying that we're still kind of beholden to French European theories of hospitality on the one hand. Um, and yes, there has been, um, you know, the, the import of kind of decolonizing thinking and practices has shaped uh, or is beginning to shape those questions. Um, and, and he's asking us, and I think probably me, uh, how we're shifting that. So maybe I'll, I'll take two minutes to talk about the methodology of my project and and how uh, to try to uh, address these questions, which is absolutely valid. Um, so my project started about the same time as yours or when yours was taking form, Lorenzo, in, in 2012. And it was born out of two, uh, two frustrations. One, uh, the fr frustration, uh, you know, the failures of political hospitality. And I would say this is where the sort of legacy of French theory, European theory comes in. Simultaneously in parallel, uh, and very much as a mirror to that, I think there's a failure of aesthetic hospitality and that has not been talked about. It's a really big question and those are dear, dear to me. And so to answer those questions, I decided to, uh, on the one, on the, uh, you know, in parallel to that, realizing that hospitality was at play um, in all forms of social relation and all kinds of disciplines. It was often um, called something else. So I decided to basically detool, retool, relearn by embedding myself with thinkers, uh, with researchers and with uh, citizens who are dealing with several questions. Hence, um, I traveled to the Balkans to learn from a very specific uh, double history, which was, you know, the legacy of Yugoslav, uh, of Yugoslav socialism and self-management on the one hand and, and the non-aligned movement. And simultaneously, uh, their, their kind of uh, attitude towards the so-called migration crisis. How could this be possible in a place where you are both um, once a refugee and now um, turning people around and so on and so forth. So the, 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 the strategy has been to uh, try to work this from the ground up rather than um, from a sort of theoretical framework down. So to learn from people and to sort of build up from there and, and to, um, and then to try to connect what is the relationship between hospitality and the body, uh, translation, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, and, and to, to look in this kind of very dynamic way across different fields through a series of exhibition, through a project like this publication where I bring a lot of people with whom I'm kind of fellow traveling. And, and I now see this project as being basically uh, the project that I will do for the rest of my life. And the second thing is methodologically also, I decided that this project was to be developed exclusively under conditions of hospitality, uh, whereby I've been in nonstop in residency since the start so that uh, the conditions of hospitality within the realm in which we work um, actually shape the project um, you know, every day. And um, so I would say that that's, that is the approach. And uh, you know, instead of swapping one theory for another, um, I'm trying to um, sort of surf and learn and, uh, and connect uh, ideas, connect people, connect projects and see what happens. So, but I don't know in terms of your practices, uh, Felipe, Bezad, and David, um, how, yeah, what is the, the sort of burden of that theory or are you looking somewhere else? Um, how, how's, how's your thinking informed? Um, yeah, I mean, if I could sort of jump in, it's uh, earlier, you know, I described the, the cultural, social, architectural history, uh, sorry, uh, preservation of Asmara and the extent yeah. to which this, uh, this mirroring of the, you know, of uh, the trace of Italian sort of presence is rooted and has really sort of taken form. And so it's a way of my insisting that the histories and the cultures that link these two nations persist in the future. That is, uh, that's the first sort of secondly, 
um, the project and my larger project in which this work fits in is really is really oriented around an insistence on the Mediterranean as a river that opens into into the Red Sea and mm -hmm. into uh, and, 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 and into the Indian Ocean. So there is a understanding of the Black Atlantic, the manner in which this has been theorized, the manner in which negritude, uh, the manner in which the colonial experience has been articulated, has been, uh, has been privileged, to, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to be blunt, in such a, you know, in a manner that leaves the specificity of Italy in North Africa, Italy in East Africa, completely sort of untouched. Mm -hmm. And which means um, this focus on when I was in my first time in sort of south of Naples, in Catania, in Palermo, there was this incredible comfort and familiarity mm -hmm. that I felt. And a part of that was a recognition that I was re-experiencing facets of what I had grown up with in a family that spoke Italian, that was deeply rooted in these Italian uh, cultural references. So this for me is where it differentiates itself. So this notion of hospitality, the notion of hospitality and warmth and welcome that I encountered in certain spaces of Italy is one that I was familiar with as, as it, right? I mean, as one that is, uh, that I've been raised with. And so for me, it's a question of positionality and orientation, right? It is really to say that these questions have not fully been, uh, been addressed because the manner in which they've been addressed has overprivileged mm -hmm. and has overemphasized particular, uh, particular methodological, but also theoretical and cultural perspectives. Well, um, I, I do agree, uh, agree especially the, the, uh, uh, the, main point, the main point here is positionality and, and orientation. I, I do agree this is very important. Thing. And thank you, Lorenzo, for very important questions. And of course, when we talk about hospitality, of course, is somehow uh, colonized by Derrida's uh, concept of, of hospitality. But always when I'm thinking about that book article of hospitality that Derrida wrote, uh, I, I, I just immediately thinking not about hospitality, but the other term that Derrida suggests in the same, same text, which is the combination between hospitality and hospitality. Mm -hmm. Is hospitality, and and always I'm thinking that that notion of hospitality is very much kind of modern subject. These are the things that's happening in the in the Western modernity. Is the hospitality? Is the hospitality which goes to hostility somehow? So, uh, but uh, following uh, David points about the notion of place and positionality and and orientation and dimensionality, I think um, the distinction is uh, well. As, as always within the modern uh, uh, way of uh, um, um, production of knowledge, that the theory comes from the West, but actual practice is happening in the, in the global South. So the notion of, you know, uh, uh, people in global South, regardless to the ideological uh, um, belief, uh, they are socialist, culturally, they're taking care of each other. And if you want to practice that hospitality, you have to come to, uh, to Tehran and, and have a dinner with my mom. And then you could actually practice that maybe a little bit of hospitality that how much, you know, they are actually into taking care of the guests. And of course, this is the part of the culture. And uh, this is the question that how is it possible to create that form of connection between the, the theoretical aspects of hospitality and actual practice of hospitality. And in that case, I think artistic practice plays a very significant role because you are not really bound in that kind of, you know, uh, form of discipline of, of, of production, uh, pr producing knowledge. So we could really play with the, with the idea of um, idea and, and practice. And of course, now we are talking about hospitality of image. But there's, of course, different levels and layers that we could practice as an artist. Well, thanks so much. Uh, we have to close this. And so I'll go to a slide share for a few thank yous and, and listing. Um, I invite everyone to join us uh, next week. We will be uh, speaking about uh, architecture and hospitality. And um, I also want to thank the people and the institutions who have made this series uh, possible, and they are listed here. Um, so the very series was built up on uh, 
I would say, uh, from solidarities from the ground up. So all of these institutions coming together to support the ongoing conversation. And here's a listing of the next uh, session. So please join us. And I look forward to seeing everyone next week. And thank you so much, uh, David, Felipe, and Bizarre. I wish we could continue this, maybe another time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.